Hi, this is a video to help you through the activities on matter and the periodic table. I'm going to start with the periodic table, which is section 1.2. This is the periodic table, and let's talk a little bit about the anatomy that organizes the elements into rows and columns. The columns are called groups, and they're represented by this purple arrow. They have numbers. You can number the columns using the normal numbering system from 1 to 18, or a more convenient and useful numbering system turns out to be the AB system. Notice that uh, this column is 1 or 1A, one 2 or 2A, two and then I basically skip all of the ones in the middle and go over to I go over to number 13 in the normal numbering system, and I label this as 3A, and then 14 is 4A, 15 is 5A, and so on. The A numbers are going to be your best friends. These are the ones that are most important for what we're going to talk about in the class from now on. However, it's also useful to know the, the rest of the AB system, which is the B part. So you basically jump down here and group 3, would be 3B, 4 is 4B, and so on. Notice that group 8B spans group 8, 9, and 10. And then I go to 1B and 2B. The groups are important because elements that are in the same group often have similar properties. For example, carbon and silicon have similar properties, they have similar bonding, and they have similar Lewis dot structures. We'll learn more about that later on in the semester. The rows also have numbers from 1 to 7, so you can just label those on, uh, from 1 to 7. And these two rows at the very bottom here don't get their own numbers. They're actually parts of rows 6 and 7. So don't give those new numbers. You could put a 6 and a 7 here if you'd like. These are the actinides and the lanthanides, and they have very little use in biology except for in some um, imaging agents, like MRI agents. I'd also like you to know where the division between the metals and the nonmetals are. So there's a staircase division here. It starts between boron and aluminum, and you just put a, a dark line, um, like a staircase, from the top to the bottom. And this is the line that divides two sections of the periodic table, the metals and the nonmetals. Nonmetals are up to the right-hand side of the periodic table on the right-hand side of the staircase division, and all the metals are on the left-hand side of the staircase division. So know where your metals and your nonmetals are. If you look at this periodic table, this is basically the answer to number one through three on your activity. You don't need to memorize all of the elements on the periodic table, but I would like you to memorize some of them, the ones that are shaded in purple here. These are the ones that are going to be most important to you as a nurse. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, are all elements that are common in biological molecules. Sodium, lithium, magnesium, potassium, and calcium, as well as chlorine, are often in electrolyte solutions. Bromine iodine are sometimes part of medicines, and iron, copper, and zinc are the three most important biological metals. Know the symbols and the, the names for these elements, um, and the other ones, you can always use the periodic table uh, to reference if you need. This is the periodic table from your textbook, and it shows all of the things that I just discussed. The group numbers are labeled 1A, 2A, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8A, and then you see the B system down here. Uh, the other thing that's labeled is the regular system from 1 to 18 in parentheses. You see the period number labeled here and you see the staircase division between the metals and the nonmetals. In this periodic table, the metals are labeled in blue and the nonmetals are shaded in yellow. Notice that hydrogen is a nonmetal. Even though it's over here on this side of the periodic table, it is an exception to the normal rule. It actually could belong right here in 7A, but it has a lot of similar properties to the 1A and the 7A so it's most often written over here um, in group 1A. But please remember that this is an exception. Hydrogen is a non-metal. The elements that are shaded in green are the ones that are touching the staircase. 
All of the ones that are touching the staircase, except for aluminum, are called metalloids. These things are, are elements that have properties of both metals and non-metals, and so they're kind of metal-like, but not quite, and that's why they're called metalloids. The most important thing to, for you to remember is where that staircase division is and where the metals and the non-metals are. So here I'd like you to pause the video and finish answering the questions in activity uh, in the periodic table activity in, for section 1.2. After you've answered those questions, you can move on to the next section, which will be the activity from section 1.1 on matter. There are two main types of matter, pure substances and mixtures. This is the chart from your textbook that shows the division between pure substances and mixtures. And of pure substances, there are two types. There are things that are simply elements, and there are things that are compounds. This image shows the element copper. Here we see pieces of copper pipe, and then a zoomed in picture of what the atoms would look like if you could see them. Notice that in this cartoon, all of the atoms are the same color, and that's because all of them are the same type. They are all copper. So this is a pure element. You can tell a pure element because the name of the thing is usually the same as the name of an actual element. You can also tell from the chemical formula whether something is an element or not. For example, if you look at the, the flowchart I have in your activity, the things that I label here as pure elements are gold and hydrogen. Here's the chemical formula of gold and here's the chemical formula of hydrogen. Notice that each one of them only has one type of element in their chemical formula. That is what defines these things as elements. You can also have compounds. Compounds are things that have more than one type of element in a chemical formula. Water is a good example. If you have a glass of pure water, the only molecules inside of that glass are water molecules and they have the formula of H2O, so two hydrogens, which are represented in this cartoon by two little uh, white dots, and the oxygen atom in the middle, which is represented by this little red dot. So all of the molecules in this glass of water are the same, and each water molecule is its own unit, it's its own thing. So this is called a pure substance, which is a compound. You can tell a pure substance um, that is a compound from its chemical formula. If we look at the flowchart that you have in your activity, notice that water, even though it has both hydrogen and oxygen atoms in it, um, it has them all in the same formula, which means that they are bound together. And when elements are written in a, in a formula or they are, and or they are bound together, that means they're one new kind of unit. So this is water. Sugar is also a pure substance. Here is the chemical formula of sugar. And notice that it has more than one type of element in its chemical formula. Aspirin is another example. Here's the chemical formula of aspirin. And it has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, all different elements, but they're all bound together into one new thing called aspirin. These are three examples of pure compounds, or pure substances that are compounds. Mixtures are mixtures of more than one type of thing. So you can have a homogeneous mixture or a heterogeneous mixture. Your book uses brass as an example. Brass is a metal that's made of copper and zinc. Copper is an element and zinc is an element. This is a mixture of more than one type of element in a solution, um, and it's a solid solution. A lot of the times we don't think of solids as solutions, but in this case, brass is an, a solution called an alloy, which has different uh, atoms mixed together. So notice that in this cartoon, it's very similar to this cartoon over here. However, the uh, colors of these little dots, which are representing atoms, are different. And so it, uh, you can see that there's a mixture of different types of atoms here. A heterogeneous mixture is when you have two different types of things mixed together that are not in the same phase. So this is, your book is using the example of pennies in a cup of water. The pennies are mixed with the water, but they're very different. So you, you would know, if you were a little elf and you could swim, you would know the difference between being at the top of this glass where there's only water 
and the bottom of the glass where there are pennies. The main difference here is that we have a liquid and a solid in the same mixture. When you have two things of different phases, and I, when I say phase, I mean like liquid, solid, or gas. When there are two different phases in a mixture, it is a heterogeneous mixture. You can tell the difference um, between a homogeneous mixture and a compound if you think about chemical formulas. Sugar water is an example. If you take water and mix it with sugar, you get a new solution, which is all liquid, and it's mixed. Um, it's, it's a mixture of water, which would be a pure compound on its own, and sugar, which would be a pure compound on its own. Another example is an, a pill containing aspirin. An aspirin pill is not pure aspirin. It contains aspirin and binder, usually cornstarch, as well as some kind of lubricant, which is usually steric acid. So it's a mixture of these different compounds all mushed into a solid pill. An example of heterogeneous mixtures are a fish tank, which contains water, pebbles, and fish. Here we have two different phases. The water is a liquid, the pebbles and the fish are different types of solids. Vegetable soup is another example. You have water or the broth and the vegetables, which are solid. So the water is a liquid and the vegetables are solid. Again, one of the main features of a heterogeneous mixture is that you have two different phases. You have a solid maybe mixed with a liquid or a liquid maybe mixed with a gas. The best way to understand these things is through practice. So go ahead and pause the video at this point and try to answer the questions under the diagram that looks like this on your activity for section 1.1. Once you finish the questions, you can go on to the next activity for section 1.6 on changes in matter. Before I go on to the next section, I want to point out what these little subscripts mean after the chemical formulas. So if we have water and you find a little L afterwards, that means that this is liquid water. An S means a solid, a G means a gas, and an AQ is a special type of liquid, which is something dissolved in water. So AQ means aqueous, and aqueous is specifically a water solution. Also notice that the chemical formulas have the chemical symbols followed by little numbers. The little number tells you the number of the type of atom that comes right before it. So in this chemical formula here for sugar, you have 12 carbons, 22 hydrogens, and 11 oxygens. In the formula for water, you have two hydrogens and one oxygen. It's very important to be able to read a chemical formula correctly. Now let's move on to the activity on, on change. Anytime a chemist wants to represent a change that's happening in matter, they use a chemical equation. The chemical equation has an arrow, and on the back side of the arrow, usually on the left-hand side, are what we call the reactants. This is what you're starting with before the change happens. The arrow represents the change, and the thing at the front of the arrow, usually on the right-hand side, are the products. The products are what you get after the change happens. Here we have two different equations written, and I'd like you to pay particular attention to the chemical formulas in these equations. We have reactants on the left-hand side in both cases and products on the right-hand side in both cases. Let's look at the first one. Notice that the chemical formula on both the reactants and the product side are the same in this uh, equation. If the chemical formulas are the same, then no chemical change, change has happened and it's only been a physical change. This is a physical change. You're going from water in the liquid form to water in the gas form. We also know this as evaporation or boiling. A physical change uh, is easily recognized because there's no change in the chemical formulas of the compounds on the reactants and the product side. Now let's look at the second example. Here we have reactants that have different chemical formulas than the products. Notice that the number of atoms on each side of the equation is actually the same, but their chemical formulas have changed. We also have a change in the phase. So for example, here we have solid on the reactant side, 
but no solid on the product side. This is not as important as the fact that the, the formulas have changed. When chemical formulas change from reactants to products, it is a chemical change. This is a special kind of chemical change that you should get used to seeing. When you take an organic molecule that contains carbon and combine it with oxygen to give products of carbon dioxide and water, this is a combustion reaction. You also know this as burning or igniting something. Whenever you burn something, you're taking organic molecules, adding oxygen, and you're getting carbon dioxide and water as the product. This is also what happens in cellular metabolism. You take organic molecules and your body takes oxygen and converts them to carbon dioxide and water. Get used to knowing that combustion is the addition of oxygen to a chemical to make carbon dioxide and water. Combustion is the same as saying it's metabolized, it's burned, or it's ignited. Now finish the questions in this part of the activity. And when you're finished, go on to the checking for understanding. Make sure you finish the check for understanding before you go on to reread or read the chapter and do the in-chapter problems. And definitely finish them before doing your online homework. I'd like to point out that the key is available on your, on your uh, Blackboard site. So if you'd like to check your answers to the activity questions, please check the key online. But don't rely too heavily on the key. Make sure you're solving the problems first on your own and only checking the key to make sure your answers are right. Don't rely too heavily on the key, but do check your answers. That's the end of the video.